for me. What's up, Cubs? Just sloppy as all fucking get out. Trapzilla City. Babe, I'm gonna keep dancing on that bridge till the stars come home. And cheer up, babe. Fucking knocked it out of the park, dude. <laughs> What's up, Cubs? Welcome back to Cheer Up, Babe, the podcast, episode 96. I am your host, VJ Julio. Vincent James Giuliano. You know, I'm a DiGiulio at heart. You know, none of this makes sense. I'm just beating around the bush trying to figure out how to transition to the next thing. And the next thing is me telling you guys that I'm moving back to Idaho. I am what I am. I'm a hooligan. Yeah, obviously we've known for a while. I mean, that's the whole reason for selling the house. And uh, yeah, we made the decision quite a while ago, like all the bosses know and everything, and gave him like a three-month notice, three-and-a-half-month notice. And uh, yeah, now it's just time to lay it out there. Now it's just time to lay it out there. The family and I are moving back to Idaho. I am what I am. I'm a hooligan. It's just the right thing for us to do. And uh you know what? I heard an interesting thing the other day that it was about, uh, you know, like no guy really grows up until he has kids. And I'm like, yeah, 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 dude, I stay grown, you know, which is not something that an adult would say. But um, I think the concept behind it is you don't really grow up until you until you care about something more than yourself. Like you don't really grow up until you go, oh, no, you're more important than me. And coming from a person who uh, thinks higher of himself than he should. <laughs> <laughs> coming from a person whose ego has always been number one uh i can speak to that pretty aggressively um the second you hold them the second they're in your care the second you watch them be born and then guess what that your life's different now and the second all that happens is the is the most ego death experience you'll ever have it is the most i mean unless you're a piece of shit but it's the most humbling experience ever because even if you're like me even if you're like me and i don't think that there's anything implicitly wrong with me right so i think like you know i know i have problems i know i have quirks i know that there are certain things about me that are uh, distasteful and as my friends would say abrasive i know that but I've always regarded myself highly. I've always liked myself, so to speak. Well, that's not true. High school, I was a piece of shit. But if you ask high school me if he likes high school me, high school me high, liked high school me. 20-year-old me did not like high school me because he was, like I said, a piece of shit inside. Inside. If you ask my friends back in high school, they're like, dude, you were funny. You were nice. You were not. Yeah, no, I was a piece of shit because I knew it was going on inside. I knew it was going on inside my soul, but here we are digressing. Welcome to my therapy session, therapy session number 96. But anyway, circling back to my point, the whole reason that Jordan and I are in Minnesota right now, let me give you guys the whole breakdown. So we moved to Minnesota initially so that I could wrestle in college. I got a full ride. I came here. Um, I had two years remaining in college because we met at North Idaho College. And then bada bing, bada boom, lock that one down real quick. Quick proposal on the podium at the national tournament after I won it. Hold on one second. Hold on. One. Let me go. I'm gonna I'm gonna run that one back. I'm gonna run that one back. You know, the proposal on the podium, putting her on the number one spot in front of all of our loved ones after I won a national championship and outstanding wrestler of the national tournament. Where is it? Damn, so I ain't been broken a minute. It's the latest fucking. Let's try that again. Is there a four second delay on this one? Woo! Nope, right away Damn, there. I ain't been broken a minute. Anyways, the timing's off on the sound drops, and that's fine, dude. That's fine. Does the timing need to be on point in order for it to have comedic effect? Yes. Is the timing off, and therefore it's throwing the comedic effect, the comedic effect off? Yes. We know that, and that's okay. But anyways. Circling back to the story, we might be digressing a lot here, but hang on for the ride because you're getting to know, you're getting to know a brief history lesson. So we met in North Idaho and North Idaho is just a two year college. So we knew we were going to be leaving after two years. And luckily I met her my first, her, our first years there. And I convinced her to come with me to Minnesota. And when I say I convinced her to come with me, um, 
I fell madly in love with her and envisioned the remainder of my life with this woman. I, I envisioned having kids with this woman. I envisioned having a family with this woman. I envisioned this woman growing old with me by my side forever. And then, oh, fuck, wouldn't you know it? That's right where we're sitting. Woo! Damn, I ain't been broken a minute. But anyways, and don't just think that she's just some following ass bitch. Let's just go ahead and make sure that you know that my wife is not just some following ass bitch. The amount of trust that I had to prove to her that she could give me was through the roof. Here's a perfect example. We're halfway on our drive to Minnesota. Okay. Plan set. Scholarships, scholarship is accepted. We're moving to Minnesota. And this is far and away the longest uh, distance that she's ever been away from home in, in terms of like a moving capacity or a living capacity. And um, we're at this hotel. I think it was in Fargo, North Dakota. And she's being quiet, and it's all right. I mean, we've been together for two years at this point. And then suddenly she goes, I'm gonna go, I have to go to the bathroom real quick. I was like, okay. I'm sitting there, I'm watching TV, and then like 20 minutes passes. And I'm like, okay. I'm going to go see what's up because 20 minutes is a never 20 minutes is a 20 minutes is an 89% of the time for me. And 20 minutes is a 0% of the time for her. So something's up, something's wrong. So I go into the bathroom and she's crying and I walk up to her and I go, what's going on? And she's telling me how she's scared. She's telling me how she doesn't know if this is the right decision. She's laying these fears out to me. She's being completely open and honest. She is at the potential detriment of our relationship, putting all of her fear, fears out on the table to me. And, and I say that the potential detriment of our relationship, because if I would have reacted a certain way, that could have been it right there in terms of if I wouldn't have validated her emotions and I wouldn't have actually listened to what she was saying in that moment and I would have gotten defensive, then yeah, that could have been a bad thing. But in, I remember that moment so explicitly because I'm the type of guy that when we're having a serious conversation, and I don't know how many guys are like this, I feel like this is guys kind of across a broad spectrum. When you're talking to us and you're laying problems out to us, we are trying to problem solve as we go. So as we're having a serious discussion, we're trying to problem solve as we listen to what you are saying. And that's actually a skill that I had to learn later where Jordan laid it out. Like sometimes I just need you to listen, but that's something that lear that I learned later. So she's telling me these things and I'm getting hit with every emotion in the book. I'm having, I'm having 15 emotions per sentence that she's saying. I'm not displaying any on my face. All right. I mean, acting 101, baby. I'm locked in. Had I gone to an acting class yet? No, that happened in Minnesota. But I still had it in the blood. You know, I'm still ready to rock and roll for Legally Blonde 2 at any moment. But I'm processing what she's saying. And my internal monologue here was so um, visceral to me. I had a full out loud, <laughs> out loud, but like in my brain, coherent conversation with myself to where someone in my brain said, this is an important moment, what are you gonna do? And in that instant, I laid out for the first time in my life, what is really important here? Is what's most important your need for validation through competing in wrestling for two more years? Or is what's most important truly everything else after that? Everything else that you've envisioned with this woman, everything else that you will build together, everything else that you will grow into and create together after those two years are up, what is more important? I had that, ex that entire thought process in the span of four sentences and a little bit of rest time with my wife in a bathroom in a hotel in Fargo, North Dakota. And she's looking at me after she lays it all out there, and I haven't responded yet, and I'm looking at her kind of stone-faced. And I can tell that she's really anxious for a response, and I go, we can turn around right now. I can wrestle anywhere. We can turn around right now. And I was dead fucking serious. Like if she would have said, okay, I think we should turn around. I wouldn't have even had a sleep in the hotel. I would have been like, let's get back on the road, and let's head home. 
That would have been immediate. But she didn't. In that moment, it built a trust in her that she knew that she could rely on me. She knew that I had our backs. She knew that I wasn't out for only myself. I wasn't going to just be looking out for myself. This was now forever an us thing. And it proved it, that to her in that moment. So we finished the drive to Minnesota and we lived there for two years. So I finished my college wrestling career there. And then we moved back to Idaho. And she hadn't finished college yet. So we transferred her to Idaho State University, right? Go Bengals! <laughs> If you know Idaho State University, you know how silly that one was. <laughs> Someone else heard that and went, oh, yeah, they're the Bengals. Cool. He, you know, school pride. No, the Go Bengals was sarcastic. But Go Bangs. And um, we moved back to Idaho and we transferred to Idaho State University. When she transferred to Idaho State University, she lost almost an entire year of credits. They didn't transfer from the Minnesota school because to Idaho to ISU because I, ISU is pretentious for no Reese. Hey, you're in Pocatello. Okay. You're in Pocatello, Idaho. Why are you pretentious for no Reese? Why you say like those credits don't transfer? They don't, they don't qualify towards a degree. You're going to lose them. They don't count bullshit. All right. But she did the Idaho state thing for, um, a year and then she became, a loan processor for an amazing loan officer. Shout out to Nessa. And she's sitting there and she's about a year away from finishing school, but she's not going to school anymore. She's a loan officer. Or she's, she's a loan processor. Because A, Idaho State sucks the inside of a donkey's dick. Okay? Shout outs. And we're having a deep discussion one night and she's talking about how much it's weighing on her that she hasn't finished school. Like, the degree itself is not important to her. Following through and finishing is important to her. And I go, well, here's the deal. We go back to Minnesota. You get all those credits back, and you got a year left. And she says, well, let's do it. So we move back. That was the move that you guys are currently existing in with us. We've been here for, poof, four years now because she did this year of schooling. And while, and while she was going through her schooling and, and got her degree, she got pregnant with our, our pride and joy. And then I got an amazing job. Now, the amazing position that I was handed ha held a lot of potential. It, it, it's an amazing job. I like my job. Um, I really enjoy being a salesman. Did not think that would ever be true. That is 100% true. I have a knack for it. And the thing is that if it was just Jordan and I, we could be out on, our out on an island all day. We could be out here. We're, we're thousands of miles away from family or anybody close to family. Thousands of miles. But you have babies. And you understand how important the sense of a community is to have around those kids. Because the second they're born, they are immediately more important to you in every aspect of your being. In every way in your brain, you understand truly for the first time that without hesitation, if it meant to protect them, you would die in an instant. So nothing outweighs that. And then you have a couple birthdays. And they don't have family around. And you have some holidays. And all you do is FaceTime. With the people that already implicitly love them. But can't be there because you are 19 hours away. And from a dad standpoint. I refuse. I don't give a shit if I was making $10 million a year. It just outweighs it. This just outweighs it. So we've made the decision that we're moving back to Idaho and that's why we're selling the house. And I am so excited. <laughs> I am so pumped up to be able to be around my family. Also, my little brother also moving back to Idaho. So they're going to have, they're going to have their unks around. They're going to have Boone and Gunner round. They're going to have pop up and Gigi round. They're, <laughs> they're going to get to see grandma and grandpa whenever. 
you know, then they are going to get to feel that childhood that is so important to a children outside of mom and dad. And it's a no brainer for us. Now, does it, is it sad to leave a job? Is it sad to leave a job with a lot of potential? And I work with a lot of amazing people that I really appreciate and that I've grown really fond of and really close to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, doesn't hold a fucking candle though. Like doesn't even hold a candle, you know? So I just wanted to get you guys up to speed. I know we didn't start out with silly williness, but the family and I are moving back to Idaho and I had to catch you up. Where are we going? Back home. In West Philadelphia, born and raised. And the family thing is, you know, the family thing and the community thing is the most important. But also at the end of the day, we're Idaho kids, dude. I belong there. She belongs there. The mountains, baby. The fucking trees and the feel of that and the smell of that. So we're moving back to Idaho. We're going to be up north. Um, I'm going to be a loan officer. Shout outs. I'm going to be a mortgage loan officer working for a fucking stud hoss shout outs as a mortgage loan officer. So um, there's not going to be a lot of crossover between um, the podcast and my actual profession. But hey, if you need a house, your man's got your back. Hey, if you want to buy a home, you know who to call and it's Papa Cup. You want you need you want a little bit of fucking razzle dazzle and flair to go along with your home purchasing process. Your boy's got your back. Also, I just realized that I'm wearing my painting jeans because I don't know if you could tell by my hands, I've been painting all damn day because that's what we're that, – fun fact, selling a house, super easy. All you got to do, paint every single square inch of the house. That's all you got to do, and it's fine, and it's easy, and it's good, and you also got to completely reassemble an entire room. You got to completely reassemble an entire room, and it's fine, dude, and it's easy. And it doesn't take any of your time, and you don't have to have time away from your kids that you uh, revere more than anything, and you're not bitter about it, and it's all good. Yep. So just go ahead and sell. But anyways, that's what I'm going to be doing, and that was a 20-minute story on where we've been and where we're going. So you're welcome for that. Thank you for sticking along for that. But now you know a little inside scoop on what's going on with Papa Cub. We will have a new den in Idaho. We will have a new den in Idaho because guess what, dude? This is true, okay? <laughs> This is 100% true. My new boss, who will be in charge of me, training me, getting me up to speed on how to be an apt loan officer, is a fucking cub. Damn. I mean, can you ask for better? I mean, this motherfucker, we've been talking. I, I reached out to him initially, initially, and I just said, hey, we're moving back, you know. Uh, initially, it was honestly, I reached out to him to ask about uh, a rental situation to see if we could potentially rent out a, a house that I know that he uses as an Airbnb, and we were kind of going over the logistics of that. And then we had a conversation uh, after the fact of that where I was like, because I love this guy. Like, personality-wise, we line up values we line up the guy's a fucking stud um i know that i know that his kids listen to the podcast a bunch and i know that he's listened to the podcast like in the past so i know that he knows me but i just was like i'm also you know it's in a sales type of avenue um i get to work with people i'm good at working with people i'm good at talking to people i love all that shit um but then after we do that initial thing where i'm like do you want me to work for you and then boom get that ball rolling and he jumped right fucking on it and got the ball rolling been a real lifesaver in all of this and just like i'm just been so great and like building the excitement for this next step motherfuckers texting me quotes of like his favorite quotes from last week's episodes because so the new boss is going to be a cub so he knows exactly what he's getting Damn. <laughs> i mean it's just working out perfect and uh yeah yeah wifey and i are excited we are now, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Is it pulling at our heartstrings a little bit to leave the house that our babies were born in? You know, to leave the house that's aggressively too big for us. That's definitely was out of our price range. Did I have to acquire a new job um, and rise the ranks in order to just afford the house that we purchased initially? Yes. You know. Do we use an do is there an entire floor of the house that is used for one thing and that's basically my recording stuff and it's basically my space? It's basically my space. Not my space like top eight, but my space as in my space space. You know what I mean? You get exactly what I'm saying. So 
Yeah. Um, it is a little weird to talk about this because I've been holding it close to the chest for so long, and now, um, now it's just out there. Now it's now we're ready to rock and roll. Everybody's going to be up to speed, and uh, yeah, that's the plan. So if I'm coming off as a little bit of reserved in this conversation more than I normally am, it's because it is, and I'm also I'm, it's also a little bit exposing. It is a little bit exposing, but at the end of the day, this is the den, and the Cubs get to know. The Cubs get to know the behind the scenes. The Cubs get to know what's going on in Papa Cubs' life, and that just is what it is. And now you know that I wasn't lying about the pure sporadic nature of the podcast drops because you know your you know your man's been skipping some weeks because your man's been up to his ears in stress and doing things. Oh, but I forgot. I forgot. I forgot to finish the point. I forgot to finish the point. So the new boss is a cub. T- motherfucker text. <laughs> Text me favorite quotes and then tells me like I'm sure I look like a psychopath laughing by myself in the car and in traffic next to the fucking person that's looking at me through the window. And I'm like, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. He has a spare room in his house that will be literally probably eight minutes away from the house that Jordan and I are going to be in. We're still ironing that out. But dude, the den is going to be in my new boss's house and I get to do an entire room however the fuck I want it. Also, you know what that means? Zero volume control. I can be as loud as I fucking want because I don't got to worry about waking up the babies upstairs. Damn. Tell me shit it doesn't work out how it's supposed to be. Tell me that there's not a hand in certain things that when, I mean, the house itself decided to create pandemonium and say, yay, leaving. But everything else, when your heart's in the right place and you're doing things correctly and you're doing it for the betterment of people other than you, shit tends to work out at least so far that's what this experience has taught me and we are extremely happy and extremely excited and jordan's gonna be so pissed that i brought this up on a podcast episode but it is what it is so yeah if you're buying a house in the west if you're buying a basically i have jurisdiction in idaho montana washington wyoming oregon california nevada utah i'm pretty sure that i have jurisdiction to give anybody a home loan so just hit your hit your mans up I'll fucking send you a piece of merch. <laughs> oh, Cubs, you ain't ready. You ain't ready for Cheer Up, Babe 2024. You ain't ready for when the campaign trail hits and we bring the den to the public. We, You ain't ready for when we start our campaigns. You're not fucking ready for Cheer Up, Babe 2024 because at the end of the day, that's probably what we're going to need in 2024 is a little bit of cheer up. We need to cheer the fuck up. I'm starting a whole cheer up, babe, fucking campaign. And y'all ain't ready. Y'all, could you imagine if I was actually the president? Oh. Oh. Would make a bad decision so immediately. <laughs> Would make a stupid call so quick, it's not even fucking funny, dude. Do you know how fast... I would tell the public about aliens if I found out that there were aliens. Do you know how fast that would happen? Here's exactly how it would happen. They'd bring me in for the briefing. They'd be like, Mr. President. And I'd be like, that's me wearing sunglasses. Because if you don't think that being president's not going to go to my head, you're fucking out to lunch, dude. That's going to go immediately straight to my head. Also, I'm only wearing a fucking mankini. I'm only wearing a mankini. And people would be like, Mr. President, if you could have a little bit of professional. Fuck you. I'm the leader of the free world. The population voted. And here I stand in my cheetah print leopard fucking mankini. Have I ever worn one of these before? No. But suddenly, as captain, I have a newfound confidence in life. So I'm in my Ray-Bans and my mankini, and they bring me in for the briefing about aliens. They go, now, Mr. President, it is extremely important that this does not get out to the public because we are worried about what would happen if the public found out about this the riots that would ensue the distress that it would cause people would want answers and we are not in a place to give those answers right now and i go okay let's hear it what's going on so i have laid out in this document all of our known sightings of aliens we also have a compound we have able to procure an entire group set of aliens it seems to be that they have visited us in subsets of three we have procured over 14 squadrons of these alien groups you are to be flown out tomorrow to meet them they are actually part of an intergalactic force that we have peace treaties with hence the fact that they stay under the radar and it is very very important that all of this stays under lock and key for the betterment of our of our safety i would go 
I understand just chewing bubblicious bubblegum cocky as all fucking get out in my ray bands just blow a bubble right when he finishes his sentence just yeah dude totally yeah dude i won't say shit that's exactly what i would say yeah i won't say shit homie what's good and he'd be like okay mr president and then they'd fly me out still in my mankini but also a fur coat because it's going to be chilly in the helicopter so i'm in a fur coat and a mankini and i got a different pair of ray-bans on different color but the ray-bans that i was wearing at the briefing the day before are on top of my head and my new pair of ray-bans are on my eyes so i'm flying out to the compound to meet the aliens and while i do that i just call up my little brothers i just i just i've already told jordan about it she's at she's back at the white house just gloss the fuck up getting a massage or some shit she ain't doing no work she ain't worried about that shit i'm having the secret service bring my kids around to where all the secret passages are in the white house so that they can explore and have some fun my wife's getting her fucking nails done getting a back massage she heard about the alien she goes oh no and i go yeah don't worry i won't say shit all right daddy's got to go save the country and then she just fucking just blow another baby in me and i'm like baby (laughs) this is important i gotta go meet the aliens for the intergalactic peace treaty so I fly out to the compound. As I'm flying out, I hop on the helicopter phone. I just go ahead and give Boone and Gunner a conference call, and I'm just like, yo, shawty, what's good? And they're like, hi, what's up, Rizzler? Because you know they call me Rizzler when I'm the president of the United States. You know they're calling me Rizzler when I'm the leader of the fucking free world. They know that. I'd be like, homie, I'm, a, I'm having a helicopter pick you motherfuckers up. I got a surprise for you. And my chief of staff goes, Mr. President, we can't have any unauthorized. Bitch, shut the fuck up. Or I'm going to throw you out of this helicopter. Who's going to arrest me? Who's going to arrest me? I didn't steal any documents. I don't have any, I don't have it. I don't have any shit that you're going to try to indict me for in Mar-Lago or whatever the fuck. I don't have any, I don't have any documents that you're going to try to bring up and stir up a, stir up a controversy about at, in my fucking Margot Robbie complex. All right. So get the fuck out of here, dude. My little brothers are coming to see the aliens. And then Boone and Gunner get there. Boone gets immediately killed by the first alien because he's disrespectful and he holds his hand out and they don't realize that that's a sign of attack and the alien literally slices him in half and I got to shrug that shit off, but I'm the president. So I have access to revivable technology that just doesn't exist uh, in the public, but I'm just like, oh my God, can we patch this kid up and get him the fuck out of here? He wasn't ready for this. And Gunner's just standing there taller than me now and five pounds bigger than me now, pissing me the fuck off already. And I'd be like, you want to shake the alien's hand? Right after he watches Boone get split in half, I go, Gunner, why don't you, why don't you go ahead and fucking shake his hand? And he goes, nah, fam, I can't, I can't do that doogie. And I go, all right, pussy. So we, uh, <laughs> So Gunner records it on his fucking Instagram live or whatever, and then all the public knows about it, and it just shows me there. And, like, the comments are like, oh, my God, they're real. Oh, my God, it's aliens. I hope This is going to change the world. This is going to change the world. But 20% of those comments are low-key. The president of the United States could fucking get it. And it's like, yeah, you goddamn right I could. You like this mankini? And I decide to release the aliens from the compound, and I take them over to the fucking mountaintops, and I let them fucking ski with my little brother Tyrus, dude. Motherfucker, this motherfucking kid, dude, I'm going to put a clip up, all right? My little brother Tyrus, all right? It's on my mom's side. This motherfucker. First of all, pisses me off, okay? But from, like, a proud big brother standpoint, this motherfucker's been skiing for, like, a year and a half, okay? He just ended last season with a fucking 900 on the skis. All right. Like he's like this, this little shit's going to go pro because he's so fucking he has no fear and he's so athletic. And he also he has this part of his brain where nothing matters. He has this part in his brain where nothing matters. Like, you know what mainly doesn't matter? Smashing your face off of a snowbank. He doesn't have that in him. He doesn't have that consciousness in him. He just goes. I bet I could do this. Let's see if I can fucking do this. <laughs> Been skiing for like a year and a half. Get fucked. You know how long it would take me to do a 900 on ski on skis? I would never do it because I would 100% become paralyzed before I ever got there. I would 100%, as my current boss would say, get my back blown out, dude. Dude, I'd be so fucked. But I'm like, but I'm like proud of him on a, on a, from like a big brother standpoint. I'm like proud of him because I've seen this kid have so much fucking potential. He's got the genetics of a fucking Greek god, 
he came and lived with Jordan and I for a couple months, and we were fucking lifting, getting after it. It was great. And he got that dog in him a little bit, but it, he, it was never pointed in a direction. It was never pointed in a direction, and that was the main problem. He didn't... I. Like that's the biggest that's the biggest issue you have with people that you care about when it's like you see like the potential, but you're not them, so you don't know what where the arrow should be pointed. So it's like, ah, you just just try shit. Just try shit, dude. You'll find something. Just try shit. And then fucking lo and behold, it's fucking triple axis fucking spin f- fucking kick flips off of a fucking snow jump, dude. And it's nutsack. It is so fucking nuts, dude. And I'm proud of him. So keep your eyes out for fucking Tyrus Moss in the fucking X Games coming up. Is X Games still a thing? Do X Games still exist? Let's find that out. They have to still exist, right? Isn't that what Sean White won a bunch of fucking shit in? You know? The redheaded guy? The athletic Ed Sheeran? Isn't that? Are the X Games still a thing? On November 19th, ESPN announces Winter X Games 13 for the first time will feature a new 22-foot super pipe for both ski and snowboard disciplines, and two new disciplines will make their debut, women's skiing slope style and snowmobile next trick. Don't know what any of those words mean, but I'm just going to allude to the fact that, yeah, the X Games still exist. The Winter X Games have been held at Aspen's Buttermilk Mountain. I mean, uh, buttermilk, you know, making pancakes, and will continue to be until 2024. Maybe 20... Maybe 2024 will be the last X Games. Or it'll be the last X Games on a fucking mountain where all you want to do is have some flapjacks. Look, I'm sorry. My jokes aren't the greatest this episode. <laughs> my jokes aren't the greatest because I, uh, I, I, I had to be vulnerable. And when I'm vulnerable, it's a different side of my personality. And it doesn't unlock the silliness as much. I'm just not here fucking goofy goobering the fuck around. <laughs> I gave you guys a big peek behind the curtain, so... It's a little bit tougher. It's a little bit tougher. It makes me really wonder about deadbeat dads. It makes me really wonder. And this is not a like, just so you know, when I tell stories about my kids or I tell stories about my wife, it's not like a, it's not like a a clap me on the back or be like, oh, VJ is such an amazing blank. It's like, no, in my mind, this is baseline like this is fundamental like how is this not just like it's like if you go to a job and you do your job and then you go like i need a raise and it's like for what dude for doing the bare minimum for doing the bare minimum i feel like as a as a papa bear as a dad the bare minimum is love and presence and that's not with a t that's with a c okay if you got confused there being present, that one's with a T, and love is the bare fucking minimum. So it makes me really fucking confused. And also, I'm not going to lie. I've I've known deadbeat dads before I had kids, and I just kind of chalk it up to be like, ah, that's just kind of that's just kind of how their life worked out. It just didn't really didn't really pan out, I guess. I guess they just weren't really cut out for it. And then you have kids and you get that emotion that we were talking about earlier with like, oh, no, this is now the most important thing on the planet. This is now it. And it's like. I understand you got shitty relationship issues and stuff like that, and it's like maybe maybe the mother of your kids doesn't trust you, so she's contentious and she doesn't let you be around the kids. You're not going to fight and also change. That's the weird thing. You're not going to change and try to be a better version. I don't understand why, I, I, I don't know why I'm getting so far in the fucking weeds on this, but it's just like, the guys in my life that I know before I had kids that are deadbeat dads, now I look at it and I go, what's fucking wrong inside of you? Like, where's your moral compass? Like, that's why I would never be like a college coach of anything. That's what, that, I'll, I'll take it a step further. That's why at this point in my life, I will never be a wrestling coach. It's the only thing I know. Great. It's the only thing that I'm really good at. Coaching and the 18 years of competitive wrestling, I'm good at that. I'm really good at that. At this point in my life, I got two baby girls upstairs, 0% chance I would be a wrestling coach. Why? Because that's time away from my kids. Even Even if it's two hours after school, two hours... 
for a season every day after school is not worth the sacrifice to me. And so I think about like my college coaches and stuff and you know, I commend them for being who they were in our lives, the athletes' lives. But then I go, how's it at home? What do, I know what we wrestlers think about you. I know what we athletes think about you. What do your kids think about you? Because in my mind, what would possibly trump that? And it's so fleeting. It's so fast, dude. Having kids is a fucking blink of an eye. Like, I'm almost thankful that Lottie is on pace with her words and not ahead. I'm not ahead. We had a conversation last night where I was like, we got to have another kid. (laughs) And and Jordan was like, well, the timing of it and, uh, uh, you know, that whole thing. And I'm like, do you understand? Everything, Everything about Charlotte at this point is no longer a baby. The only thing that's baby-ish is the fact that she doesn't speak to us in full sentences yet. She just knows words. The second that she speaks to us in full sentences, we don't have babies anymore. We have two toddlers. The baby phase is over already. Already. It happened fucking yesterday, dude. And you have you have little kids for what? Six years? Six years, and then it's done, and then it's over. Like you, you don't have that little kid anymore. You have like a, it's like a child. It's like another person, where it's like you got to start focus. You got to start focusing on making sure that they're a good human being, not just the utter enjoyment of watching them. I mean, it's still going to be the utter enjoyment of watching them and watching them grow, and that that will never end. I feel like that won't end until I die. Like, that won't end until, yeah. I mean, they'll be 45, and I'll be, like, obsessed with watching what they do and where they are and what they're making of their life. But now, as a baby, you get to have that, and they they give you the best. They give you the best relationship that you will ever have if you're doing it right. And how could anything outweigh that? God damn, this episode is kind of (laughs) heavy. (laughs) <laughs> like I get to do ba- I, I, I I do bedtime with them every single night every single night and everyone knows that too like it doesn't matter what's going on when it's bedtime everything else shuts off I have I have to put my girls to bed and it's the same schedule every night take Lottie into her room read her a couple books now she gets massages she gets little baby massages dude and it's so cute cuz i can always tell by her body position when she's ready to transition from book reading into like let's shut the lights off and and we'll i'll finish a book and i'll go you want a massage and she's got her binky in her mouth and she'll be like holding her binky with her little teeth she's only got like six teeth and they're in different spots in her mouth so she looks like a little baby hippo i love it dude she's got like two back molars two top molars and then her front four teeth and i fuck she's also got big teeth like me like she got big teeth and (laughs) and they are the fucking cutest things but anyways she holds her binky and i'll be like you want a massage and she goes yeah (laughs) holding her binky in her teeth actually she talks a lot higher pitch than that so it's yeah (laughs) And I go, okay. And I pick her up and I walk over to the light switch, turn the light switch off, turn the uh, air purifier on. That's what we use. It's like a white noise machine for her. And then I go sit back in the chair that we read books in and she full reclines onto my, her, the top of her head is just constantly rubbing my chin and her fuzzy little hairs tickle the shit out of my chin the whole time, but I don't care. And I just, so it's, it's something I learned from, uh, it's like baby chiropractor that we used to take the girls to, um, where they're talking about this, the sending signals to them. This is when, even when they're like babies, this is a little life hack for you. So if you want to calm your baby's nervous system down, so babies like to be cuddled, of course. Right. But now Lottie is like a bigger age. She's, she's older. So she doesn't like to be like cuddled. She doesn't like to be like completely wrapped up. She, she, she likes to be completely wrapped up if if she's facing out, but you know, the concept of like 
if she's not tired enough, she won't like completely like this because she likes to have free movement of her arms and stuff. But what you can do is compression, and that's what I do. So she reclines on my chest, and I start at her shoulders, and it's literally I just squeeze her shoulders, and then I release it really slow, and I move down one hand width, and I squeeze her arms, and I release it slow down to her elbows, forearms, hands, and then I go back up to her shoulders. So I'm not like fucking massaging her. You know, it's not it's not deep tissue. I'm not fucking breaking her muscle fibers apart so that the blood flow gets better and she has a better recovery. I'm it's compression. So then I go down to her legs, and I squeeze her legs, squeeze her knees, squeeze her calves, squeeze her feet. She loves her feet, dude. She loves her feet. But what that does is it calms their nervous system. So it sends signals to their brain of calming down. And, I mean, 10 out of 10 times it works for me. <laughs> like 10 out of 10 times I finish that. I get her in a better laying position. And then I go, you want to go in your bed? And she goes, yeah. <laughs> I go, okay. And I put her in bed and boom, she's out, dude. And it's so funny. She loves her feet so much now. Like she loved, I just, her her whole f her foot fits inside my hand because she's got those little summer sausage feet. So <laughs> I could squeeze the whole thing. <laughs> and I just like, but she loves that so much that I go, you want a massage? And she goes, yeah. And I go, turn the light off, lay down. And then she just, she just like reclines on my chest, but then lifts both of her feet up. And I'm like, I'll get there. I'll get there. And I'll like go to like compress her shoulders. And she'll be like, uh, and lift her feet up in the air again. I'm like, all right, fine. I'll start at your feet. But, and then like tonight, I'm laying with Gracie after that. And uh, so then after I get Lottie in bed, Gracie goes in her room and waits for me now. She doesn't read books with Lottie and I because she can't hold still. So she lost her privilege. So she goes in his her room and plays for the 15, 20 minutes that it takes me to get Lottie to bed. And I go into Gracie's room like tonight. I go into Gracie's room and I go, all right, baby, let's read one book and then let's go to bed. And she goes, I'm not going to bed. And I was like, yeah, you are going to go to bed. And she goes, I'm not tired. And I was like, you will be. She's like, no, I don't think so. And I go, let's see. You want to see if you'll get tired? Let's read a book. And she goes, let's see. That's the, that's the level of conversation that we're at. <laughs> okay. Like, just so you know, I'm fucked, dude. Just so you know, I'm so fucked when it comes to my kids. They're already pushing, and I love it. But still, lay down, read a book, cut the light off. And, we, and I lay down next to her, and she always goes, live me for a minute. And I'm always like, yes, baby, I will lay with you for a minute. And tonight I lay down, and we're on our side. We're face to face, and she goes, I see it. And I was like, you see what? And she was like, I see it. I'm not tired. And I was like, I was like, y okay, well, let's just lay here and let's see if you get tired. And she goes, let's see. And I was like, oh, dude, the tie into like, let's see to I see it. And I was like, what do you see? I'm not tired. <laughs> so she's almost always face to face with me. But we lay on our sides and then she always like wraps up my arm in her hand and just holds on to it. And tonight she like did that and she and she has her eyes closed and she goes, daddy, your eyes closed. And I was like, yes, baby, my eyes are closed. And she goes, good. Daddy can't leave if his eyes closed. <laughs> I was like, God damn, dude, how do I not just fucking sleep in here every single night? <laughs> but then she gets, she hits a point of tired where I go, okay, baby, I'm going to bed. And she goes, don't let a bed bugs bite. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> oh, man. Well, fuck. Should we try to end this, silly? Should we try to end this fun? Do some unqualified dad advice or something? Should we do some Am I the Assholes tonight? Try to make up for the seriousness? I'm sorry if this wasn't your vibe. I'm I'm sorry if this wasn't your thing. Um, But it's mine, so go fuck yourself. Okay, Am I the Asshole? All right, let's see what kind of shit people are stressing out about today. 
Am I the asshole for asking my boyfriend to pay me back after he ate my food? This is from a 24-year-old woman, and her boyfriend is 25. My boyfriend and I have been dating for a year. We moved in together a month ago. We both split expenses. That is rent, some groceries, and bills. We each buy our own self-care products. Shampoo, body lotion, body wash, stuff like that. Well, yeah, homie better not be buying Nair, you know what I mean? And groceries. If we buy anything that's meant to be used or consumed by the two of us, then we also split the cost. He works till late every day. I work a normal 9 to 5 job. Because of this, I eat dinner alone every weekday. The other day, I ordered a pizza. The place I like doesn't have individual pizzas, only regular sized ones. I ordered a pizza and ate most of it. There was three slices left. I put them in a recipient. What the fuck is a recipient? Is this from a foreign person? I put them in a recipient. I mean, I'm sure she just means like a Ziploc baggie. Recipient meaning. Let's see if there's any side meanings of recipient. We're just going to learn. We're just going to learn. A person or thing that receives or is awarded something, receiving or capable of receiving something. Recipient meaning with saving Food. This is important. These are the important issues. Everything I talked about before this was not important. Finding out what the definition of recipient or if it was just a typo is important. Nothing cop- Nothing popped up there. Is another word for Tupperware a recipient? Receptacle? Is that what she meant? I think that's what she meant, and I think that she's right, but we can all agree 110% of the fact. Who the fuck says recipient? I'm looking for the next sorry fuck cock in my soul. I'm going to fix this. There were three slices left. I put them in a Tupperware and or Ziploc bag to save it and eat to eat it later. The day after, around mid-morning, I went over to the fridge to grab something else and noticed that my food was gone. I waited until my boyfriend woke up and asked him if he had ate it. He said he did, so I asked him to pay me back for half of the pizza I bought since I had paid it all for myself. He laughed because he thought I was joking, but I told him I was serious. I brought that to myself and paid for it. He had no right to eat it. He was angry at me and called me selfish for not sharing with him. I told him that's not what we had agreed upon when we moved in together. Now he's upset with me. Am I the asshole? Okay, so here's where I sit. I sit on two very, very drastically different sides of this, okay? And let me tell you why. Now, my first question to you is, did you get a roommate? or a boyfriend that you share a household with. Hey, are y'all just roomies? Or are you testing the waters for future life together? You know what I mean? That's where my initial brain goes to, where it's like, you guys share everything else. You know what I mean? Like, hey, if you're going to live together and start a life together, you're sharing everything. Also, you're going to eat a whole pizza. That's a side note. That's a side note. And I'm not one to talk because I'll eat a whole pizza in one sitting and there won't be no three slices left over. But that's not good for you. He's doing he's doing it for the betterment of your health. All right. So do you got a roommate or do you got a boyfriend? You know, that's my initial question. Now, I will say that there is a direct story about this in my personal life for the first seven months of dating. Jordan and I did not fight once. Not one time did we argue or bicker or chew each other out it was sunshine and rainbows until the day until the day now she pretty much explicit she had a dorm but she basically explicitly lived with me there was a day i get it We're broke. I mean, you're 24 and 25. You guys should have a little bit more money than a broke ass fucking college 20 year old. But regardless, I digress. She had leftover Cafe Rio and I ate it and she didn't talk to me for three days. Uh, I ate her leftover Cafe Rio at one in the morning and she was so mad about it the next day that she didn't talk to me for three days. It's like she saved up all of the, the fact that we hadn't fought one time in seven months. She saved up seven months of unreleased tension through normal fighting that happens in a relationship for that one fucking instant. Dude, after three days, I had to finally go over to her and be like, is this what's going to do it? And she was like, what? Still bitchy because still pissed. So pissed. I was like, this is what's going to do us in? Me eating the remaining third of your Cafe Rio? 
And she, and then we got it all out on the table, and she felt that it was very disrespectful from the s- fact that I was not thinking about her feelings in that moment, and I laughed while simultaneously saying I understand. But let's bring this, let's bring this down to the size that it actually is. Also, I'm not one of those guys that you're going to be able to pick stupid fights with over. I'm not one of those guys that you're going to be able to fight over nothing with in this capacity. So you're going to have to figure that the fuck out. I'm going to laugh this off. I won't do it again, but we're not fighting about this. Also, don't ever pull that silent fucking game bullshit on me. So I'm sure if you asked my wife, she would say, dump him. But if you ask me, you got a roomie or you got a boyfriend? (laughs) Scroll. Stop. Am I the asshole for not wanting to get rid of my roommates as per wife's demands? I mean, I don't even have to fucking read it. I already know how it's going to go, but let's try it out anyways. Never fucking mind. It's 11 paragraphs, dog. Here's the deal. This guy's married, but he has roommates, and his wife wants to move on from having roommates. For sure. We don't even have to read it to understand that. And just glancing at the first sentence doesn't bode well for you, my guy. The first sentence is this is a couple of 34-year-olds. If you're 34, you don't get roommates. I don't make the rules, dude. That is that is in the Cub Bible, dude. I don't make the rules. I just tell them. I don't make them up. They just are what they are. If you're 34 and married, you don't get roommates. Okay? Don't live in a place. Don't live. Don't have a living situation where your house broke. Okay? Live within your means together. Okay? You're going to be 34 and every morning your wife's got to wake up in the place that she lives with her husband and be like... What's up, Jerry? And Jerry's waking up on the couch like, hey, Elizabeth, wh- how fast, how soon before your roommates start fucking banging your wife while you're at work? You know what I mean? Like shit just kind of shit just kind of snowballs into that. So, yeah, probably don't have roommates at 34 with a wife. You know what I mean? Am I the asshole for wanting my boyfriend's mother to stop asking about my birth control? Probably not. What? This is from an 18-year-old. I have been dating my boyfriend, who, and he's 19, for a year. I love my boyfriend, and I have no serious issues with him until recently, and that's because of his mother. A couple months back, his grandmother found a Plan B pill in his truck that he, we had used because accidents happen, right? Yeah, he be busting nuts in ya. Well, his mother thought this was to be extremely concerning and had a serious talk to my boyfriend about it, which I understand. However, I told my boyfriend I don't think it's her place to tell me what to put into my body and I do not wish to discuss it with her. He in turn told her that I was uncomfortable with talking to her. Well, later, when I came to his house to spend time with him after we had all had dinner, she trapped me in a conversation and talked to me about birth control. She talked to me about the patch, the pill, IUD, and the implant. She also offered to pay for the IUD for me, which I recognize as kind, but it still seemed incredibly intrusive because it wasn't something that I wanted from her. At the time, I didn't know if I had the right to be upset about the conversation. At that time, I wasn't on the pill because I didn't like the weight I was gaining while on it, and the idea of not having my period at all made me extremely anxious, so I was trying to find other options. She did not ask me once why I wasn't on it, what I was doing to take precautions, or why it was that I had taken the plan B. She did not care to know, which frustrated me and made me feel like she thought I was stupid and reckless, even though I am just as anxious. Fast forward to now, two days ago, my boyfriend randomly asks me what pill I was on, because after the conversation, I went back on it, because I never wanted to talk about it again and thought it was just the end of that. My boyfriend has never cared what pill I was on, so I found this question to be odd. Yeah, he's fucking, he's spying for mommy, you know? All he cares about is busting nuts, all right? But then mommy gets in his ear. I asked him why he cared. He said he was researching it, which I knew was bullshit, and said, did your mom ask? He came out clean and admitted that, yes, his mom had asked what specific pill I was on. I was furious with my boyfriend for bringing the conversation back to me when he knows that I don't want to talk to his mom about my birth control, and I was upset with his mother for once again treating myself not like a person. Weird sentence. But like, oh, once again, for treating myself not like a person, but like something her son sticks his dick into. Well, let's continue. She didn't ask how I was or how my life was going, but immediately asked about my fucking vagina. Yeah, because it stemmed from the fact she found a plan B pill in Okay? 
first impressions last a lifetime. It was later in our argument that he told me his mom had said that she wouldn't let him see me if she didn't know what specific pill I was. Oh, now, yeah, now she's definitely doing now because she was going to think he was going to get me pregnant or that I was lying. How about teaching your son how to wear a condom and or be better at pulling out? All right. I mean, you're talking to the pull out champ. Ask my kids. Okay. (laughs) I was batting a thousand before two and a half years ago. So anyways, I feel furious with his mother, but I'm unsure if I'm the asshole for being upset about it in the first place. And if I'm blowing it out of proportion, I don't know if I should talk to his mother directly and tell her to stop asking about my body. Okay. From a parenting standpoint, I get it. All right. From a parenting standpoint, I understand the whole, like, you guys are young and dumb and literally full of cum, and, but also being 18 and 19, it's like, hey, if you didn't teach him fucking the right things to figure out to this point, what's she doing, you know? Um, It doesn't bode well for your side that this all started with a plan B, which means that you guys, uh... In a parent's eyes, you guys seem like you're just uh, fucking round. You know, you're just like happy-go-lucky, lackadaisical about just getting nuts busted and shit. Because when you see something like that, your brain initially goes to, they're lazy with it. You know, they're not not paying as much attention to this as they should. Um, From your standpoint, yeah, dude. What do y'all call it these days? The ick? You probably get the ick. From both sides. You get the ick from mom and you get the ick from mama's boy. You know? So I get it. But also, just be better. If you don't want to be on the pill, that's fine. Tell him to wear condoms and pull out. And that's just great parenting advice right there. <sighs> All right. Let's do some. Let's wrap this up with some unqualified dad advice real quick. Actually, you know what? We're going to circle back with the Cubs. Okay? You remember Jazz Sentinel Chicken? Uh, my husband's best friend is in love with me. You remember that one from a few episodes back? Remember, remember, there was like, he got drunk and said that, like, oh, you're so lucky because I want to fuck Jazz or something like that. He said, like, oh, you don't deserve her. She's so amazing. I want to fuck Jazz. Remember he said that? Remember he said it in his best man speech or whatever? It was something along those lines. <laughs> Do I have it pulled up and could just read directly from the script? Yeah, but I like to annotate, you know? I like to annotate. I get down to the crux of it. Um, This guy had jealousy with his friend, and I told you that uh, you should talk to your husband and say, like, yo, he's disrespecting the relationship. Period. He's disrespecting the sanctity of your marriage, period by saying inappropriate things about you to your friends you know and then he call, called out on him and he said yes and you know and then you said like and then you said like i feel guilty because my husband might lose his best friend no 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 none of that okay now let's see she did a follow-up she followed us with she followed up with the cubs she she stayed true to the cubs She jumped back into the den and she said, all right, guys, here's what happened after the fact. All right. Just basically redundantly, redundantly explained to you what the fuck a follow up was after I already said follow up. Welcome to the show. So she says, update. I sat down with my husband and laid it all out. We couldn't avoid it anymore. And I wanted to know his thoughts. He was hurt. Obviously, I suggested he sit down and talk with Aaron. And he said that would be a good idea. They met at a restaurant and hashed it all out. My husband said Aaron was really embarrassed and apologetic. My husband said he forgave him and made it clear that if we hear anything else about this, that him and Aaron are done. Aaron came over a couple days ago and he gave me a hug but didn't really say anything else. Thank you for the advice and I appreciate you taking the time to read my crazy post. Keep on dancing on that bridge, Papa Cub. God, I love you, Jazz. Fuck yeah. Um, All right, cool. I mean, yeah, handled it like bros. Um... Aaron better fucking watch his steps, dude. All right, that's fine. You guys are giving him a second chance. I get it and everything. You know, and my response was from an outsider perspective where I don't know the intricacies of the the friendship. I understand that it's like brotherhood and stuff like that, and I get all that. Um, And good on you for sitting down and having the conversation, and good on you 
and good on your husband for having that fucking tough conversation because that's so that's confrontational and it's uncomfortable and you're calling out a good friend. So A plus is across the board. Nice job. Um, and Aaron better fucking watch his step. You know what I'm saying? Like Aaron better just keep his emotions under lock and key. You know, because at this point he's not just fucking with uh, his best friend's wife's relationship. He's fucking with a cub. <laughs> if you want to bring the fury of the den down on you, dog, if you want the whole fucking show, all people listening, every single one of you, this is your responsibility. You're a part of the den. This is how it works. You want the whole fucking show to come up to your door, dog? Oh, <laughs> stop saying, dog, you're 30. It's part of the show. OK, it's part of the it's part of the personality trait that comes out when I record these episodes. All right. But regardless, let's wrap this one up. Fucking love you guys. If you listened all the way through this one, I really appreciate it. If you could give a review somewhere on whatever on whatever streaming service you listen to, go ahead and give a review. Always helps out the show. Um, thank you guys for listening to a little bit of backstory, a little bit less silly time. I hope you guys got something out of it. I hope you guys are having a great start to your week because of it. I'll see you in the next one. Go out there. Don't be a bummer and cheer up, babe.